Uh, we have uh, an extremely interesting panel here to discuss the key questions of this conference. Uh, multilateralism and multipolarity, the idea that we have moved from a bipolar world is of course old hat. It happened way back uh, at the turn of the 90s. By 91 or so, uh, there were articles about the unipolar moment. And then in the 21st century, the idea became that we are living in an increasingly multipolar world. Now we have six panelists from poles of different sizes, as it were, uh, and they have the task of laying out for you how exactly they see the existence, emergence, or transformation of the world order in terms of multiple poles, and how one expects countries affected by this transformation to deal with it. For example, the multilateral approach where countries, large numbers of countries, and ideally all countries, come together for a shared management of the world order. And other approaches, bilateral in particular, and regional or sub-regional, in which specific countries exclude others in pursuing their space, in, in shaping their own space within this new order. So to explore all of these, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give us their perspective very briefly for just three to five minutes. Then we'll have a discussion amongst ourselves. And for the last 15 or 20 minutes, depending on how long-winded we all are here, we will have an opportunity to engage all of you in this conversation as well. So it's, a, it's meant to be a conversation and not a series of speeches. But I'm going to start with having each panelist lay down their markers, as it were, on this issue. And I'm going to start with Vyacheslav Nikonov, who is a member of parliament in Russia, in the state Duma. And I'm going to ask Mr. Nikonov to tell us, is this multilateralism, multipolarity, whatever, the new normal? What's normal about the new normal? And what is, in your view, uh, the state of this issue before all of us today? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, it's great pleasure and honor to be here to participate in such an important conference uh, on an issue of the new normal uh, of which I'm not sure I know all the answers. What is the new normal? Is Donald Trump the new normal? <laughs> or, or new abnormal? Uh, or Vladimir Putin, is he uh, a new, the new normal, the old normal, or just normal? Uh, is Brexit, or whatever exit, from the European Union, hot Brexit is the new normal for the European Union? Uh, what is the new normal of French policy? Excuse me, Mr. Jacques. Odebert, you started first. Uh, what he said was an expression of the outgoing administration, which has supported maybe 5% of the French public, or maybe the new normal is what the French candidates with uh, great chances of winning are saying now, and which is completely different from what we heard at the previous panel. Uh, the rising India, China, becoming indispensable powers. Is it the new normal or is it the old normal? Actually, I think it's a very, very old normal. Back into 18th century, uh, India and China uh, combined uh, accounted for 60% of the global economy, and they're just coming back. Actually, the third economy in the 18th century world was the biggest European economy with 5%, and that was Russia. Uh, there is nothing new in, in the world, and nothing new is under the moon, though at the same time there are certain uh, new realities and the new normals. BRICS being the new normal, uh, a very different thing. It's uh, something 
in the lines of what uh, Hamid Karzai yesterday uh, said or referred to as the cooperation of civilizations. It's the new normal in the dialogue between the great countries. The expanding Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, at the next summit, India and Pakistan will be sitting at the table as full members, and there is Afghanistan, there is an, uh, uh, Iran, there is Turkey, uh, staying in line to uh, the enlarged Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which can be a bug, bug for bigger Eurasia, which can also, at some point, include the European Union, which is also a Eurasian country. Uh, China and India becoming not just the great powers, but also indispensable powers. What is the new normal for Russia? Uh, I think different Russians will give you a different answer. My answer is that the new normal for Russia is being a forward-looking, uh, independent-minded, uh, Euro-Pacific uh, center of power uh, with uh, conservative instincts and without major global obligations. What the new normal should be or might be. Uh, in my view, there was a moment in history when we could think big about the new normal that was after the end of the Cold War. Uh, but at this point, uh, instead of uh, thinking about the new global or at least European architecture, which could be all embracing and to the best of the humankind, the West celebrated uh, the victory uh, in the Cold War and expanded the zone of uh, unipolar domination. Uh, in my mind now, uh, it is time to think big and maybe to think of some new broad arrangement in the terms of the concert uh, of Vienna, maybe global this time, in the terms of this cooperation of civilizations mentioned by Hamid Karzai. Uh, actually, I think uh, the new normal should be Russia-American dialogue, and uh, the dialogue of all the major powers on how to make uh, the life on Earth much better. So the new concert might be and should be, in my mind, the new normal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mikhanov. I thought that was uh, an interesting definition of, of, of the challenges, but we've, of course, gone to a perspective that focuses on a bilateral relationship there more than perhaps on the multilateral theme, and that's important to understand that for some countries that may well turn out to be more significant. We'll come back to this in the course of our conversation, but our second speaker uh, is the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran, of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Syed Qasim Sajadpur. And I'd like to ask Mr. Sajadpur, uh, from Iran's point of view, uh, does multilateralism work? Is this the appropriate way of dealing with the world? Mr. Sajadpur, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, I would answer an Iranian perspective rather than the Iranian perspective. But all the questions that you, you have and the questions that we have in this conference are of two, let's say, layer. One layer is analytical and cognitive, and that is how we understand the world. And the second layer is prescriptive and uh, how, and policy level, policy oriented, and how we respond. I think in answering to this type of layers of question and your main question, I would say I have A, B, C answers. A, in the, this world that we live, actors are become very diverse and of multiple layer and uh, diverse nature. That's very important to keep in mind that we are not dealing with just several uh, few big powers. I think the era of big power is over. And it is the base of multilateralism. Multilateralism means all actors matter. And it's not just five close or two or three who can solve all the issues of the world. And I think, uh, yes, the uh, actors are diverse and they are of asymmetrical nature, 
but they all matter. A small powers, uh, small states, uh, regional powers, big states, everybody matter, and I think this diversity should be taken into account. I would like to underline that in this new global context, regional powers have become more important and have, get, have gotten more space. A space is a fundamental concept for understanding of what we are talking about, and I think regional players are very important to keep in mind. And we cannot ignore any player. The second is B. We are witnessing a building of new nature in international relation, but the first component of this building is that the maintenance of the old building is very costly and it is not effective. So you cannot keep this building as it was right after World War II or when it was, uh, let's say, 60s or 70s. The building is, has so many problems. And I think for new building, you have to keep into account that the concept of power by itself has been evolved to a new definition or new definitions. It's not just the military might, which is the base, though we cannot ignore the military might. And I think, furthermore, the concept of pole is different with the past. So in this building, poles, polarity, power, I think, has new definitions. Furthermore, I think what's interesting is you have meaning, narratives, identities, or also components of different actors as well as the building. So keeping this in mind, I go to my C, and that is commonality of interest still is the base. Yes, we are diverse, but still commonality is very important, and I think this commonality brings us to the institution of diplomacy. Diplomacy matters. And I think diplomacy is more needed than any other time at this juncture. And the base of diplomacy, of course, is bilateral diplomacy. The base of multilateral diplomacy is bilateral one. And I have to report to you that these days bilaterals are very important. Furthermore, I think trilaterals are important. I would underline that Many multilaterals are also important. We cannot have global, let's say, overarching uh, multilateralism, maybe at place everywhere, but we can have multilateralism of different sort. I have some examples of Iran and India as players, actors, participating in, in this new building and really working on their commonalities and using all these channels that I mentioned, and I'm happy that it was reported about the trilateral Iranian, Indian, Afghan, and I think all this matters. So I think multilateralism is a key component of today pol international politics, and it can work, and it can work better than the past. Thank you, perfectly on the dot. We have a little clock flashing there, and that was within our time limit. Um, Multi, we've heard bilateralism, we've heard a vigorous defense of multilateralism, but with bilateralism as uh, the basis for multilateral diplomacy. I'm going to turn to Ambassador Robert Blackwell. Uh, Bob is known here as a former ambassador to India. He's now on the Council on Foreign Relations in the US. And Bob, you've just published a book on geoeconomics, which adds a new vocabulary to this discussion. What is geoeconomics and how does it, what does it have to do with all of the multipolarity and multilateralism we're talking about? Uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, and it's uh, great to be back in Mother India always. Um, uh, when uh, I started looking at the subject geoeconomics, uh, I found through the literature uh, that there was no good uh, definition for it that uh, was recognized, although the word was used very, very often. So the definition in the book uh, that Harvard has published uh, is that geoeconomics is the use of economic tools 
not for economic purposes, but for geopolitical purposes. So that's the definition. Let me stress that's very far from what Donald Trump is talking about, which is economic tools for economic purposes. And indeed, uh, in, in, at least in some cases, what he's talking about would have negative geopolitical effects, like weakening NATO and our alliances and so forth. So uh, as I got into the subject, I looked at, well, who uses geoeconomics, as I've uh, d defined it, uh, successfully? And there are a list of countries that are actually represented here, uh, beginning with China, who's a longtime uh, practitioner of using economic instruments for geopolitical purposes. Uh, for at least the last 25 years, usually quite skillfully. Just to give you one example, uh, it's uh, a persistent effort to persuade countries that recognize Taiwan to uh, change the recognition to Beijing through economic incentives. It's classic geopolitics. Uh, if uh, Japan does something to China it doesn't like in the uh, South China Sea, uh, sorry, in the East China Sea, uh, Japanese automobile exports go down, uh, imports into China uh, go down and so forth. So China has been quite successful. Russia has used uh, geoeconomics, uh, again, for a couple of decades at least, uh, at uh, both incentives and disincentives for other countries' behavior. Uh, cutting off fuel to Ukraine in the winter would be a disincentive to try to persuade Ukraine to act, in Russia's view, more responsibly, or supporting the economies of the Central Asian states. Uh, these are incentives. The Gulf states, of course, have transferred uh, tens of billions of dollars to General Sisi's Egyptian regime for geopolitical reasons and so forth. Uh, curiously, of trailing the field here is the United States. Curiously. And it's curious because we have a long history of geoeconomics. We didn't send an army uh, uh, west to conquer the Louisiana Purchase. We bought it. And that's a perfect geoeconomic uh, action. Or think of the Marshall Plan and so forth. But uh, sadly, uh, and more recently, not just since 9-11, but certainly since 9-11, our policies have become overly militarized in my judgment and uh, uh, we reach for the gun too quickly. Uh, and the book urges uh, a transformation of U.S. policy to use geoeconomic diplomacy persistently, comprehensively. Finally, India, I think that, and there will be many in the audience who uh, could be uh, definitive on this, but I think uh, this prime minister is the first prime minister to comprehensively use geoeconomics in the way I have uh, described it. It's not uh, called that, but his reaching out to his neighbors and beyond with infrastructure incentives, economic incentives, trade incentives, at least is uh, partially for geopolitical purposes. I. Uh, want to just stress in closing that in this new multilateral, the new, as uh, uh, Dr. Nikonov said, the new, new, or the old, new, or the new, old, uh, this is going to be a prominent instrument of uh, national policy by the countries represented here. Uh, uh, I didn't mention Iran, but it's also often skillfully used these geoeconomic geo geo tools. And uh, those who don't have command of these tools will do less well uh, those countries than those countries that do have command of these tools. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. So in fact, <clears throat> in a sense, you're trying to recommend a move away from sticks to carrots. Instead of sending the Marines, send in the dollars mm -hmm. or, or, or withdraw the dollars. Mm -hmm. Interesting, and I think we will want to pursue some of that. But since we've got these practitioners moving us gradually into the realm of theory, let me turn to a professor, Professor Shen Ding Li is at Fudan University in China. And uh, perhaps you can tell us, because obviously everyone sees China 
as a new pole in the world system, uh, which wasn't a pole till late in the 20th century. So from your perspective, Professor, multipolarity and is multilateralism useful when you're such an important pole? Well, uh, when I became uh, enrolled by Fudan University 38 years ago, uh, 19, the year 1979, China opened, started economic reform. China was a pole, but not a P-O-L-E, but a P-O-O-R, a poor country. Uh, but it's a still big country, and we feel comfortable to work with other country on a bilateral case, one-on-one. -on -one. So we are smart, we are principled, we are, st we are still resourceful, but that's very much not efficient. We want to make the China, China not a poor country, but a poor, P-O-L-E. So you need to raise efficiency to engage the world uh, holistically. We need to join the World Bank, joining IMF in order to get a grant. I got my PhD from Fudan University's Department of Physics. Uh, after that, I transformed to be an uh, uh, international relations uh, professor. So I spent 10 years working on computer. I'm, I was a, a, a computational physicist. So F Fudan University used the World Bank loan, and we used, used that money to buy the US Navy's uh, Honeywell computer. So I am a beneficiary of China's opening, a beneficiary of China's integration into the world system, and a beneficiary of China-US uh, uh, a partnership. For this, I'm eternally grateful to Deng Xiaoping and to uh, President Jimmy Carter. And over time, China returned the grant and we returned the interest. And we start to have the money, we start to invest. Two years ago, China's uh, aggregated investment abroad has been more than China's uh, uh, FDA received uh, from abroad. China bought 1.7 trillion US dollar uh, as importation from other country, next only to the US. And China not only benefited from its uh, uh, exercise of multilateral uh, international system, but also used multilateral international system to return to the world. They used to help my country. So we are a major member of the UN, uh, ADB, IMF, United Nations, WTO, WHO. We also start to initiate something new. China not only gives the money invested in other countries on a one-on-one -on -one case. We still do. But we try to invite a friend to work to together to uh, reinforce the effectiveness of Japan-led ADB. So we created something uh, similar to ADB, but uh, that is also a lot different because we only focus on infrastructure. And ADB covers not only infrastructure, but also poverty uh, reduction, education, forestation, etc. And we have received a friend from all over the world from India, from Saudi Arabia, from Canada, and we're still waiting for the Trump administration to partner with us. So this is multi multilateralism. Through adopting multilateralism, which initially posed a challenge because China is not familiar with this. But we think this is a challenge, but it's more than a challenge, it's an opportunity. So we acquaint ourselves with multilateralism to eventually become an expert on this. I would say we love multilateralism. We continue to benefit from multilateralism. And through multilateralism, we become a pole. I do not understand why America would not continue to foster multilateralism to sustain its superpower or competence. We can help America to sustain its competence. So Jack Ma went to US to meet with President-elect to, to promise 
to create one million jobs. Many other Chinese successful businessmen would partner with him. Of course, President Xi Jinping endorsed this uh, bilateralism or multilateralism. So I think we have greater hope. President Trump and President Xi Jinping would have great opportunity to partner together for road and belt initiative and for infrastructure uh, partnership. He would invest 500 billion US dollars in first year to build a road. As long as it's open for bidding, China would try to uh, partner. And we already partnered with India. President, uh, Prime Minister Modi came to Fudan University last year to create Gandhi and the Contemporary Indian uh, Center at Fudan, of which I'm a principal in, uh, 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 researcher. And he had a chat with Jack Ma. I hope Jack Ma would also promise to create a million or 10 million jobs in India. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. And I must say, the, you made two or three references to Jack Ma, the new apostle of multilateralism. I, I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. I'm going to turn to Mr. Ali Nasir Muhammad, the foreign secretary of the Maldives. I hope I won't be offending you if I were to say that Maldives is in no danger of being seen as one of the emerging poles in the new global order. So how does a small country, um, and you know, let's face it, small states account for more than two thirds of the membership of the United Nations. So um, while, while we may joke about it, the countries sort of claiming or declaiming multipolarity are actually a minority of the world's countries. So I'd like to ask a uh, foreign secretary of a small state, how do you see all this talk of multipolarity? Uh, and indeed, there's a difference there because multilateralism is obviously in the advantage, to the advantage of small states. But how do you particularly see multipolarity in this context? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's, it's good that uh, you pointed out at the beginning uh, that multilateralism uh, is favorable to small states such as the Maldives, uh, which is an idea that uh, we took it uh, with uh, great interest at the point of independence. The Maldives gained independence in 1965, in July. Uh, within the first two weeks, we submitted our application to join the United Nations. Uh, the decision to join the UN uh, just a couple of weeks after gaining independence at that time was uh, uh, counterintuitive and also controversial. Um, counterintuitive because uh, the, the prevailing wisdom at that time for the newly independent countries of Asia and Africa was to gain recognition uh, from the key powers in both camps in the, in, during the Cold War. Uh, and joining the UN for the Maldives at that time was controversial because uh, there were question marks raised about the viability of very small states uh, being members of the United Nations, whether they have the, uh, they have the capacity to perform the responsibilities of the UN. Um, but for us, it was uh, a matter of necessity because uh, for a very, very small country, to be able to manage the complex, uh, complexity uh, of the um, relationships. Uh, the UN provided a platform uh, in which we could undertake such relationships in a less costly way. Uh, so the leaders of the Maldives at that time prioritized multilateralism or bilateral relationships. Okay. Right. Uh, they prioritized multilateralism or bilateral relationships at the very beginning. Uh, but as our friend from Iran mentioned that uh, bilateral relationships provide the basis for engagement in multilateral mechanisms. Uh, our faith in multilateralism uh, continues to be relevant uh, over the last 51 years and, and it has served very well. Uh, but it is also underpinned by uh, very strong partnerships that we have established uh, with countries such as India uh, and also beyond our region uh, that has, uh, uh, the, the, the basis of that relationship has always been mutual respect. Uh, but while the Maldives remains uh, very engaged and very active uh, at the UN, um, the Maldives is currently the chair of the Alliance of Small Island States, leading uh, global 
efforts in climate change and sustainable development. Uh, the MOLDIS also works very closely uh, with regional countries, key partnerships that we have forged over time. Um, the question uh, uh, that small states ask themselves at multilateral mechanisms increasingly in the way that, is, that has been evolved uh, over the recent past has been whether uh, increase in dominance or prominence that is being placed on multilateralism, whether it dilutes a country's ability uh, to maneuver uh, and its own policy autonomy. Um, we have been working very closely with uh, multilateral actors and also bilateral partnerships to reinforce the, uh, the core values of uh, national autonomy um, and also the country's national sovereignty. Uh, while multilateralism provides a mechanism, a useful mechanism and less expensive mechanism for countries uh, as small as the Maldives to address global issues, uh, at the same time it also um, provide a way in which uh, countries' own national priorities can also at the same time be promoted uh, uh, in that mechanism. Uh, multipolarity or a new world order that emerges, a uh, question for small states is whether the new norm, uh, using uh, the terminology that has been here, whether the new norm provides sufficient space for small states to, to be able to navigate within the uh, complex web of uh, relationships uh, that characterize the global order. Thank you. Thank you, Fonzik. Actually, that was an interesting uh, perspective, the question of whether multilateralism and multipolarity affect the room for maneuver of small states. Uh, I would actually venture that it does on the grounds that with multilateralism, you multiply, as it were, the extent and reach of your sovereignty by having multiple partners, and, and obviously no one dominant partner. Uh, but with multipolarity, you in a sense have a sort of expanded version of the old Cold War binary, in which if one big power isn't helpful to you, you can turn to another, or a third, or a fourth. So once again, your room for maneuver as a small state tends to go uh, larger with the more poles we have. But we can talk about all this as the discussion wears on. Our last speaker for this first round um, is Lisa Curtis of the Heritage Foundation in Washington. And given that we're just two days away from the inauguration of President Trump, let me ask Lisa to bring all of this perhaps theoretical sort of discussion right down to an immediate, uh, immediate uh, headline news, which is uh, what does Mr. Trump's impending inauguration mean for multipolarity and multilateralism in the world? Lisa, you have the floor. Thank you, Shashi, and thank you to ORF and uh, the Indian Ministry of External Affairs uh, for inviting me uh, to this conference. It's a real pleasure. So I have the easy task of looking at or putting into context how a Trump administration might impact multipolarity and multilateralism trends. Uh, and I want to raise three general points. And the first point has to do with the tweeting. I think there's sort of been a, a generalized anxiety, not only in the US, but also across the world, about the extensive tweeting that we see from President-elect Trump. But I think the way we should view these tweets as his way of trying to drive the overall media conversation and his way of communicating with his followers and as a way to sidestep the mainstream media which he has uh, ex expressed a great deal of uh, distrust. I don't think it's for us to pour over every single word of every single tweet, uh, but rather see it for what it is, his way of communicating with uh, his followers. The second point that I would make is to emphasize the checks and balances uh, within the US democratic system. Uh, there's a lot of chaos right now uh, in general, but I would note we have 240 years of experience uh, of practicing democracy. It's a time-tested system. It's a resilient system. Um, and, I, you know, we see right now the checks and balances playing out in the form of the confirmation hearings of the cabinet nominees, 
uh, I would urge people to look at those statements carefully and uh, you know, observe how they will influence U.S. foreign policy moving forward, how they'll be shaping U.S. policies. And thirdly, I would uh, put into perspective uh, Trump's call for an American first policy. Uh, certainly this has, has been a, a reoccurring theme uh, for President-elect Trump, but I don't think we need to necessarily equate it with retrenchment or isolationism. You know, Trump was elected because he understood this feeling in a large segment of the population of America of feeling betrayed by Washington or feeling their concerns were not being heard in Washington, that there was more focus on the internationalist, globalist perspective rather than looking at the concerns of the American heartland. And all you have to do is look at the, an electoral result map to really understand and digest this phenomena. And certainly there will be changes in U.S. policy aimed at protecting American workers, but Trump has also committed to rebuilding the U.S. military. And what that tells me is he very much cares about American leadership in the world. Um, and I think asserting American leadership certainly requires maintaining key alliances and partnerships, uh, seeking multilateral cooperation on those most pressing issues that we face, whether it be um, containing nuclear proliferation, uh, fighting terrorism, preventing armed conflict, uh, just to name a few of these pressing global challenges. Uh, and one thing that I like to point out is that uh, you can put America first, but if you want to keep America first, you have to maintain America's leadership role in the world. And to do that, you need alliances and coalitions to sustain that. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. You did say that we shouldn't uh, parse every single word of every single tweet, but let me assure you from bitter personal experience, that is exactly what the media is going to do. Uh, you can convey that back to your friends in the White House, that, uh, that Mr. Mr. Trump's tweets will be taken apart with a fine tooth comb as they, as they emerge, and will be the stuff of news stories. Uh, as we've already seen, I think yesterday, in when he inadvertently typed the wrong handle or hit a return, on a tweet to the wrong handle instead of addressing his daughter, addressed a waiter in Brighton or something, and <laughs> that young lady has become famous overnight. So uh, uh, do watch out. But I think we've, we've had a very interesting first round, a number of major markers laid out. I'm going to be a bit um, uh, Indian here and, and try and relate this uh, to the situation in the host country of the Rizina Dialogue, which is very simply that um, uh, clearly, multipolarity is an issue which has had some salience in India. There is a perspective that India is a country that should be one of the poles in an emerging new world order. And I'm curious as to how today, in the current trends visible in 2017, our panelists would see that aspiration and how they would define uh, from their own perspective, and I realize the perspective will vary from the Maldives to China, but I mean, from their own perspective, how they would see uh, uh, India uh, relating uh, to their own countries and to the world at large in this context of, of multipolarity uh, that we've talked about. So I just, if you don't mind, I just started one end of the, of the Rhine bulb and move, move down. Would you like to uh, have a crack at this yourself? And we'll just give everyone a chance to tell us uh, Briefly, what they think how India would fit into um, to this this pers uh, this perspective. Well, you know, we're starting down here. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, India's rise is inexorable. Uh, the pace is uh, uncertain, but the direction is not. Uh, and the second part of it is uh, well, 
what about my country? And of course, that brings up what Lisa Curtis was uh, discussing. Um, of course, it's impossible to predict virtually anything that the new president is going to do. But that doesn't stop tens of thousands of pundits from giving it a try. I'll only give it a try with respect to India, and I predict very good, strong relations between the Trump administration and India, partly because he won't pay any attention to them. Uh, that's it, you got it. Uh, uh, and also because of the momentum in the relationship that has been built over the last several administrations. So I'm quite uh, optimistic about uh, U.S.-India relations, uh, and uh, I expect the United States to continue to strongly support this inexorable rise of India to great power. Thank you, Bob. Slava? Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, Russia and India represent a rare example in international relations because we are the only pair of great countries which never confronted each other. We never, ever in history. Uh, so, and uh, we think that's uh, uh, something which is precious and something which will continue. Uh, you may be sure that Russia is not going to do anything to harm the strategic relationship between uh, Russia and India. So we definitely welcome the Indian rise to the great power status. Uh, the second uh, part of your question is about the poles of the world. I'm not a student of physics. Unfortunately, I'm a student of history and political science. Uh, and so I'm not sure where there, there can be more than two poles, just from physics. <laughs> Three. Three, three, will, three, three poles? will be stable. Three will be, st <laughs> but for, for, for Earth there are just two poles, <laughs> south and north. You know, so w geopolitics is, is different so, from physics. Uh, uh, two polar system is something we should we understand. Multipolar, of course, is more difficult from the point of view of nature. Uh, how many poles? Uh, maybe, of course, the United States, of course, China, uh, India, perfect chances of becoming a pole. Russia, maybe. Uh, if uh, it uh, uh, becomes stronger economically. Brazil, pretty good perspective. Japan, uh, n not in the, in the direction it's moving now. Japan is not, uh, I do not consider Japan to be an independent center of power uh, and with the ambition of becoming a pole of the world. Uh, European Union, we don't know what is the direction of the European Union. Of course, it is a huge geoeconomic force but geopolitically, it is not capable of doing anything. And uh, to be a pole, you need to project some policies. And the European Union is not in a position to really uh, be uh, a focused foreign policy uh, player. So uh, yes, I think the answer to your question, uh, whether India is rising as a pole, sure. Uh, how many? I don't know. OK, well, I think. Uh that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Obviously, I, I, the vocabulary, you're right, is contestable by any physicist. But, uh, but the, the idea that there is more than one center, because we lived for a good 50 years with the notion of two poles, which was, of course, centered on the Soviet Union and the United States, and the other countries congregating, almost magnetically attracted to one pole or the other. But even there, as Professor Shen would say, there was a third pole, and that was the non-aligned lot, uh, which tried to stay away from both the main poles. Um, so maybe physics never quite applied to geopolitics anyway. <laughs> Professor Shen, why don't you have a crack at the same question? Uh, I always teach my students that India is a pole, long time ago already. Uh, on the softer side, India has uh, independent foreign policy. Uh, despite the uh, China-Indian border clash, India persistently supported China uh, to return to the UN. I mean, I mean the mainland China return to the UN, regardless how the two sides had a border clash. That's very independent, very moral 
That motivates me to view India to deserve a permanent seat in Security Council. And India openly disagree with the U.S. war, uh, with the, the, the war on Libya. And even the opposition party has defeated Gaddafi, India sti still voted in the UN General Assembly not to support uh, the new government. And my government abstained. Indian government disagree. Indian fully deserve such a moral uh, uh, poor, superpower poor. And India is a human resource rich for. Indian national received Nobel Physics Prize long time ago. None Chinese national has ever received by today. And uh, we have overseas Chinese, Chinese American. They are not a Chinese, they are American. And India has nuclear weapon. India has a good relationship with most of the P5. And is still able to manage its relationship with China. India does not need China to, to buy its friendship. We don't have the money when I become a university student. We were poor. India supported us. That makes me to view that India is a poor. We need at least three poor. Then the world would be stable. One poor, we depend upon the whether this sole superpower is erroneous or is responsible. Two poor can be not stable. Three poor, stable. Four poor may not be stable. Thank you very much. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> I think you're going to get a lot of enrollees from here into your class, your course in <laughs> Fudan University, Professor Shen. Uh, asking Mr. Ambassador Ali Nassim Mohammed about India, I'm reminded of uh, famous Mexican uh, statesman Porfirio Diaz's comment about the United States. So far from God, he said about Mexico, and so close to the United States. So asking any small country about a big neighbor is uh, fraught with peril, but let me ask you, Foreign Secretary. Right, uh, thank you. We see uh, the rise of India uh, as a source of strength for the Maldives. Maldives is just 30 miles uh, away from, uh, from to the south of uh, India. And um, the Maldives pursues an India first policy uh, that has been announced uh, here in Delhi. Uh, uh, last year, and that has always been the case. Uh, the Maldives line uh, so close to India, and also uh, our uh, trade is so much dependent on India. Um, the rise of India is a uh, source of, as I say, source of strength, uh, and also uh, we benefit from that. Um, as you know, the Maldives uh, has an economy uh, that is extremely dependent on external trade and I India is an important partner in that. Uh, we also believe that uh, growing strength of India is, uh, is a good thing for Indian Ocean region. Uh, the Maldives lies right at the center of Indian Ocean. There's uh, equidistance uh, from Maldives to Africa and to East Asia. Uh, our neighbors uh, to the west is Somalia and to the east is Indonesia. So, um, any change or any development that takes place in the in, in Indian Ocean uh, will have significant impact uh, on the Maldives. Uh, so we have an interest in maintaining stability uh, in Indian Ocean, and we work closely with India. Um, uh, and our relationship uh, in this part of the world uh, uh, is also designed uh, in a way that we can take it uh, beyond the region uh, at a global level as I pointed out earlier, at multilateral level. Thank you. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. So for the Maldives, India is a poll, whether or not the rest of the world sees it that way, and that makes, that makes entire, entirely a lot of sense. You won't be saying then that the curse of Maldives is so far from God and so close to <laughs> India. Glad to hear it. You're 30 miles away from my constituency, I might add. Right. The nearest airport to the Maldives <laughs> from India is mine. Uh, Mr. Sajatpur, your perspective on uh, the multipolarity, multilateralism debate in the context of India? It is very positive. Three very quick points. First, 
I think the idea of multipolarity, which is proposed and advocated by India, is very liked by us. Because, as I said, normative frames are also important. I think it's a normative uh, context, it's a normative frame, and I think this uh, multipo multipolarity uh, is very needed. I have to have a conceptual, let's say, footnote here. The vertical bipolar system that we had was from, let's say, above. Now we have this idea of multipolarity is a type of horizontal outlook, which means everybody is needed to be included. And this is what we like. Second point, with India, we have civilizational ties. As Prime Minister Modi yesterday mentioned, civilizational ties are very important. I think that's a context, but uh, it's not enough. However, we have added to this civilizational um, context a very good bilateral relationship, which I think is a model. It is not defined against any other player. It is based on the com communalities. And the third point is, I think we, when you combine all this together, we think this idea of multipolarity, civilizational ties, bilateralism, would really help peace and security in this region and globally. This is why we are 100% with this idea of Indian notion of multipolarity and multilateralism. Thank you very much. You have this fondness for three points each time, which makes it easier to follow your argument. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, Lisa, with the inauguration looming again, if you can expand your earlier comment to focus on India for a minute. Yes. So certainly the U.S. views India as a major pole and sees India as, as a, a major part of its overall Asia-Pacific policy. And we've seen enormous progress in the India-U.S. relationship in particular over the last couple of years, uh, whether it be the designation of India as a major defense partner, uh, putting it on par with the U.S. closest of allies in terms of technology transfer, or the signing of the logistic sharing agreement, uh, which happened last August. Um, there has been enormous progress, and I fully expect that to continue under the new administration. Uh, but if we're talking about multilateralism, we should also mention Afghanistan and the fact that uh, you have you know, a US-led coalition there, 40-plus uh, NATO and other troop-contributing nations and I think it's safe to say that the new administration will remain closely engaged with that effort as well. Uh, you have an incoming Defense Secretary, General James Mattis, uh, a National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General Flynn, with deep experience in Afghanistan, and they view Afghanistan as a major front in the global war against terrorism. Uh, so I think we can fully expect the U.S. to remain engaged there. But I will add that uh, if we really want to make progress in Afghanistan um, and make that difference, uh, we can't repeat the same patterns and mistakes that we have made in our relationship with Pakistan. Uh, we need to reformulate a strategy that enforces aid conditions on Pakistan and that links the U.S.-Pakistan bilateral relationship with U.S. objectives in Afghanistan. Uh, the security situation has been very dire in Afghanistan. As we all know, we had uh, a series of attacks just last week, killing over 50 people in one day, uh, including a, a diplomat, an Afghan diplomat who had been posted in the U.S. and who was on holiday in Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Yama Qureshi, who we lost in those attacks. Uh, these are aimed at weakening the will of the international community, of, of the Afghan forces, um, but it's simply not an option for the U.S. to turn its back on Afghanistan. Uh, and we certainly know that a Taliban resurgence in the country would facilitate the revival of al-Qaeda 
it would uh, essentially uh, reinvigorate a new generation of Islamist extremists uh, throughout the world. And I think this is an outcome that nobody represented on this stage would like to see. So right. I think we all agree with that. There must be some questions. There are mics in the hall. If you would be kind enough to walk to a mic, is that possible? Or some of you want, we only have about 10 minutes. Yes, go ahead, young man. There are mics in the hall. Uh, for those in front, you'll have Shashi, to just you walk. Have, Shashi, you have five minutes because there is a keynote and the minister has to catch a flight. So you have five minutes. Come five on. minutes. So I think we probably will not have time for all the. So the, the three people standing at the mics will get their question. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, because they, they have their mics already, Dari, that's a problem. I'm really sorry about that. We'd love to have heard your voice. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to Ambassador Robert Blackwell. Uh, there's an old adage in international relations that only national interest remains permanent. So in a multilateral framework that we are aspiring to establish, how do we reconcile with the competing national interests uh, that are almost at play? Uh, for example, we saw the Chinese interest which precluded them from supporting India's action against Masood Azhar. So in a such, such a situation, how do we re reconcile the competing national interests to establish a multilateral framework? Okay, thank you. thank you. Next question. We'll get three or four questions in and then we'll give them a chance to answer. Um, no, the gentleman behind, if you don't mind. He was at the mic before. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Justin Bronk from Brucey in London. Um, my question comes around uh, what I'll term multifactualism. Uh, we all know that countries need to balance their values and their interests, but when uh, we have, for example, declarations from Mr. Trump that climate change was made up by the Chinese to ruin American productivity, Russia denying that it militarily intervened in Ukraine to crush the ATO, and uh, China denying that it's continuing to build islands and militarize them in the South China Sea. How within that framework can a multilateral system work in harmony when we can't agree on a baseline of facts? The post-truth world. Sir, in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Bajwa, uh, the editor of Indian Defense Review. My question is to Professor Sheng. In this uh, overarching umbrella of the theme of this lecture, of this dialogue, my question is that, or rather my, I would say to China, that you have, through your clout, isolated uh, and forced countries to isolate uh, Taiwan all these years. And uh, how long is this going to continue? And I feel it's more of a human rights question. Are you going to take a referendum of the people's aspirations? and uh, bring in Taiwan into this mainstream. You know, you can talk of everything else, but you can't keep such a large population out of the mainstream of, this, uh, of the world. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid, uh, sorry for just, the last just, two, but just, I've just, just been told I have to wrap just up. Just one question, just one question to uh, Robert Black, uh, Honorable. So, I want to tell you one thing, you tell about the geoeconomics, you know. It said that finance is the gun, politics is when to pull the trigger. And it's exactly happening right now. Do, do you acknowledge that American financial systems and European Union okay, is collapsing think, because, of, because the global idea of the globalization is dying? Okay, we, got, we got the question. I'm really sorry we don't have the time. Bob, will you start the answers? Because we... Uh... Every nation uh, that has any sense takes its national interests to international settings uh, as the basis of its policies and the uh, conflicts and uh, contradictions between nations' national interests are either uh, settled by compromise or by war. And uh, I think we all prefer compromise. Slava, do you have a comment on the question about post-truth or any of the questions? Uh, there was a, a, a question about Russian forces uh, in, in East Ukraine and Russian denial. Uh, you know, a Russian military is a serious thing. Uh, uh, maybe we are not uh, the first militarily, uh, but definitely not the second. Uh, and there is uh, not a single military goal in Ukraine that Russian army cannot achieve in matter of, uh, I would say, days, to be modest. <laughs> so uh, in order to have Russian forces uh, uh, removed from uh, Eastern Ukraine, which is the demand of 
many in the international community, we first need to move some forces in. Uh, by far, uh, the uh, Ukrainian government, unfortunately, is uh, fighting mostly uh, against the coal miners and taxi drivers in eastern Ukraine, not very successfully, uh, but uh, killing, uh, still killing, dozens of people, which I think is a bad thing, uh, and Russia being sanctioned for, uh, for actually the war crimes of the regime in Kiev. It does mean to say we do not have sympathy with those Russian people who are get killed there by the Ukrainian government. But uh, the solution in eastern Ukraine, of course, is for Kiev to implement the Minsk agreements. Uh, sometimes I hear uh, from our foreign friends that Russia should implement something. If you read the Minsk agreement, there is a, not a single article which Russia has to implement. Russia is not a, uh, even mentioned there, but there are like 10 points to be implemented by the Ukrainian government and they have not started even uh, okay, even I, I think we won't go Sorry. into more details of your own mind because I'm getting warning signs about the time. Professor Shen on Taiwan, perhaps. Uh, Taiwan is a part of China. <laughs> Just like uh, my China is a part of China. China includes mainland China and uh, Taiwan China. But uh, they have different uh, name, ROC or PRC. So we live comfortably with my interest government in Taiwan, that uh, both sides stick to one channel, but uh, we interpret that one channel in, in its own way. And each has its uh, uh, liberty in, in seeing the others to say different things. Uh, America recognized us till 1979. For this gentleman's uh, notion, U.S. ignored mainland Chinese human rights for 30 years. I don't want to think this way. I think Americans love us. They think we have wrong system. They want to fix our system, and they took some punitive action. But America failed. America had to work with us to show it loves, it loves us. Okay, I think we'll have to leave that. Then I wait one minute. Therefore, I would see that the current uh, discord across Taiwan Street, I hope uh, this gentleman would not think that we want to hurt the human rights of Taiwan. And we want to unite in, under one roof, in one name. Eventually, uh, our all human rights, entire Chinese ethnicity would be pro better protected. But thank you for raising your question. I would work harder with Chinese living in Taiwan to make that day to come uh, true as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Professor Shen. And last word will be uh, from Minister Sajatpur. Thank the you. The other two, I think, didn't get questions directly addressed to them. Very so good. Very Actually, I have very, a very quick point. First of all, a few pronouncements or a few decisions by member states of international community would not negate multilateralism. Multilateralism is an ingredient of international life. You cannot delete it. Second, multilateralism is not just a Western uh, domain. Now it is beyond West. It is actually two-thirds of the United Nations, as you said. And finally, the commonality of interest requires more work on multilateralism. So I'm not worried about these pronouncements about uh, multilateralism, it would uh, stay with us and maybe would be mo more stronger. There we are, an inescapable reality, multilateralism and multipolarity. The time is truly over. Thank you all. Please join me in giving our panel a warm round of applause. <laughs>